didn't think my insurance would cover it, but uh, they took the stitches out. Mm. Did it hurt? Yeah, it was amazing. Oh, oh, hey, Ryan. <laughs> oh, oh, <clears throat> Hello there, welcome to another episode of Poochers at Play! This week we've got another feature-packed episode with all the usual fun and plenty of informative health tips to make life with your pooch even more enjoyable. <laughs> Not everyone has a pooch as pawsome as me, but with my training tips, you'll be a few steps closer. Ah, <laughs> uh, I'm the trainer, you're the dog. Guyton, what's going on here? Oh, Lara, meet Hiff. He's our guest presenter for today. Hello, Lara. Look, do you mind letting us finish what we're doing? Time is money. OK, OK, get on with it then. Uh, Guyton, we'll chat later. All right, um... Uh, oh, look, now you've ruined my mojo. If anyone needs me, I'll be in my trailer. Oh, no, Hiff, please, come back. I... Actors. When it comes to choosing your first pet, sometimes a dog's a little bit more to take on. A fish is a great alternative. Not only are they great for kids, they're a really lovely living decoration to have in the home. Now I'm here with Kiri. Kiri, I've been hearing rumours around town that you're the fish specialist at Petstock. That's right. Now, if I was going to get started with some fish, what kind of tank should I start with? It's a really good question, Guyton. For children, you probably want to start with something small, around 15 to 20 litres. Just gives them an opportunity to get involved with the cleaning, the feeding, just the general care of the fish. For adults, something probably a bit bigger, 50 to 100 litres is about the right size to start with. But it also depends on what you've got your heart set on. Some fish are going to need to be in a bigger tank to start with, so that's where you would go. But as a general rule, 50 to 100 litres is a good place to start. And you also need to consider the living space you have available in your home. Yeah, right. So in terms of living space, where shall I put my tank in terms of light? Yeah, absolutely. Look, there's a few things again to consider in this point. You want to make sure that the tank is not in direct sunlight, that it's not near a drafty window, or that it's not near direct heating. All of those are actually going to affect the fish and their home as well. You also want to be near a power point. Fish tanks require multiple power points, so have a power board available. Also consider the space required to do the cleaning and the maintenance. And the last one to remember is most tanks come with a stand, but for those that don't, do you have somewhere suitable for your home? Yeah, I'm more of a party kind of guy, so I think I'd like a lot of fish. Is there anything I should consider about how many fish I can put into my tank? It certainly is. So it depends on the size of the tank you have and the size of the fish you want to put in there. So obviously, the bigger the tank, the more you can put in, the smaller, the less. The other things to consider is some fish are what's called schooling fish, so you need to have groups of six or more for them to actually feel comfortable. And then there's the other side where there's some fish that just like to be alone for whatever reason. So really important to do your research about compatibility and make sure that everyone is happy in that tank. So what about cleaning the tank? Do I have to do it often and, and also how do I go about doing it? Yeah, absolutely. Generally, you'd probably look at a fortnightly rule. So what that's involving is actually doing the cleaning inside, making sure you're wiping away any algae or anything unknown that's in there. You also want to be doing a really good quality water change. So what the water change does is actually removes some of those unwanted wastes that are left in that tank water, which again may be harmful to fish. And once you've done the water change, also adding a high quality water conditioner. Water conditioner neutralizes the chemicals in water that make it safe for us to drink, but they're actually quite harmful to fish themselves. So that's really important that, that you stick to a routine with that sort of thing. All right, Kerry, thanks. That's really helpful information. Where can I go to find out more about fish care? Really easy, Guyton. Jump on the internet, petstock.com.au. You'll find a local store there. Pop in and see one of our fish specialists and we'll get plenty more fish facts from them. Right, well now I'm going to have to mull it over whether I get a fish tank or not. <laughs> How many litres is this one? 50 litres. Okay. So Chris, if we bring home a new puppy and we want it to go onto a big dog raw food diet, what should we be doing? The first question we need to find out from the breeder is what were they feeding this mm -hmm. puppy um, prior to that. So if they're feeding a high carb diet, like a kibble diet, the transition will take it probably another four weeks. So okay. what you're doing there is we're going to slowly introduce the meat to the diet mm -hmm. um, over two weeks. We will drop the pH of the, the puppy's tummy. Okay. So the only way we can do that is start introducing fine mints mm -hmm. to their diet um, slowly. So you might be an 80, 20, 70, 30, 50, 50 yep. until you get to uh, through about two weeks. That will then drop the pH of the puppy's tummy and mm -hmm. then we can slowly start introducing some of the bath diet as well. But after the uh, around the 12 week stage, that puppy should be able to go 100% onto a bath diet. Okay, so bath is bones and raw food. Well done, Lara. <laughs> I'm learning. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. Mm, 
Jeez, that seems a bit steep. I, I didn't think it'd be that much. Hef, Hef, are, you, are you OK? What's oh, the matter? Yeah. G'day, Dr Mel. I, I'm just wondering why my last visit to the vet seems so expensive. No, oh, you don't have to be like that and throw it away. I mean, it's, it's a normal business. There's running costs involved. There's gas, there's rent, there's electricity, there's admin, there's staff to pay. Mm. And that's before you even get into the medical costs. I mean, you think about what happens when you go to the vet. Who helps you make the appointment? That lovely receptionist that smells like flowers. Oh, and then there's the friendly vet nurse who always makes sure I get a treat. Or two. Or three. <laughs> when I come in. <laughs> well, you've been pretty lucky. And that's before you even get to see the vet that all that happens. Hmm, I hadn't thought about that before. I guess there is a bit involved. There is. I mean, there's the normal running costs that we were talking about, but then we have to buy and maintain the medical equipment that's required to diagnose and treat all the different species and diseases that we see. I mean, some of that equipment can run into tens of thousands of dollars. Whoa! Well, I guess you're not like a doctor's consulting rooms, are you? No, no, we're different to that. I mean, we're the surgeon, the dentist, the anaesthetist, the radiologist, the pathologist, the pharmacist. You get the point. Yeah. And then we have to have a fully equipped theatre and all the medical equipment that are required to look after you guys. It sounds as complicated as human surgery. Well, it is. It's very similar. Except that human surgery is subsidised by Medicare and private health insurance. So it's very easy for owners to underestimate the cost of procedures on their pets. Mm. I mean, take dentistry, for example. If you needed a tooth with a cavity removed. Oh, well, how hard can it be to pull a tooth? You would be surprised. I mean, unlike humans, you're not just going to lie back and let us pull out your tooth while you're awake, are you? No, I'd probably bite you. Oh, but I just thought the nice vet gave me an injection, I fell asleep, and away they went. It's a lot more complicated than that. I mean, before we even give you an anaesthetic, we have to do a full examination and make sure that there's no risks to you having all those drugs and going under. I mean, what about if you've got a heart disease or something? You can't just talk and tell us. Well, actually, you, you can. Yeah, but I'm special. You're very special. We might have to do a blood test. There's the pre-med, the induction agent, the gaseous anaesthetic, which we deliver via a tube that we put down your throat. And then while you're under anaesthetic, you'll have some IV fluids, and then we'll monitor your heart rate, your oxygen saturation, your blood pressure. And then if you have a tooth removed, we'd have to give you painkillers, anti-inflammatories, antibiotics, in injectable form while you're under. There's a lot involved. Oh my God, there's so much involved. I knew I liked those vet staff for more than just the pats and the treats. <laughs> Well, the equipment that we use is pretty much the same as what they use in humans. I mean, your teeth and your body aren't that different, you know. <sighs> so there's more to it than I thought. And then I suppose there's some recovery time as well. I don't usually go straight home after I've had a tooth removed. No, I mean, unlike humans who do lie back and just let the dentist do what they need to do, you've had an anaesthetic. So we have to recover you and make sure you're okay. There's a post-op check that we might have to do. We have to clean the theatre, sterilise all the equipment that we used on you. And then, I didn't want to say it, but there's all the towels and blankets and the hospital bed that you've used. Okay, I'm starting to understand the vet bills a little bit better now. Oh, so much time and equipment and medication and staff, it's crazy. I definitely don't want any other dog's cooties after they've had a tooth removed either, so I'm glad for that. Geez, Dr. Mel, I sure I'm glad I have HIF pet insurance now and that I got dental cover as well. Otherwise, I'd have to get a second job sniffing out bad guys or something. <laughs> if you haven't got pet insurance yet, why not? It's not too late, though. Just visit the HIF website for peace of mind for when your fur kid's feeling poorly. <laughs> our basic cover policy ensures cats and dogs of all ages and our higher cover options are available for cats and dogs under nine. Thanks for clearing that up for me, Dr Mel. Now, uh, there's just one thing I was hoping to see you about. I've got this itch just behind my ear. Wonder if you can have a little look at that for me. Oh, oh, there it is. Ah, yeah. Ah. <laughs> 
Anxiety in pets is a common concern for many owners. It can be genetic, it can be something that was triggered by a negative experience when they were young. It could be fear-based, separation anxiety, it could be a current environmental trigger. The list goes on. So I can't give you all the answers now. So what I can do is help if your dog has some mild separation anxiety when you head out to work each day. I like to call this tip the Looney Lara. And it's quite easy really. So if your dog is prone to anxiety when you leave, give this a try. Now you see, dogs are watching our every single move. When we wake up, we tend to be creatures of habit, so we always do the same routine. So what I want you to do is change it up every day. It might add another five or 10 minutes to your exit, but your dog or cat will love you for it. So think about how you normally get up. You wake up, you go have a shower, you have your breakfast, and then you leave. I want you to do that in reverse. I want you to get up, have a cup of tea, go out the door, come back in, get dressed, sit down, watch the television, get up, go back into your bedroom, come on out, make another cup of tea, go out the door, come back in. All the while your dog will be watching thinking, what on earth are they doing and when are they coming and when are they going? So by the time you actually exit, they're so over watching you that they're gonna be chilled. So what I want you to do is keep practicing that and changing it up. And then of course, it's really important to make sure they have plenty of environmental enrichment as well when you're out all day. Our website has plenty of info about that. But do give the Looney Lara a try. I mean, we do a lot with Darcy and you don't get any more relaxed than that. It's a tough life, mate. Studying a certificate in dog behaviour and training isn't just for people that want to go on to become a professional dog trainer. It can actually help any owner that wants to understand why dogs do what they do or how to read their body language better. Now Liz, why did you decide to do the NDTF course? Well, Wara, I'm involved in dog rescue. I was the founder of Hair of the Dog Rescue. We founded that three years ago. And I thought I knew a little bit about dogs. <laughs> But in that, I also knew I needed to know mm. more to help with the um, problems that present. Yes. So therefore, I actually sought out some dog training and ah. that's how I ended up at the NDTF. Right, because I mean, that's just that, you know, I thought I knew dogs was always working with them and then you realise just how we don't. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So in, a lot of people actually want to go on, you do foster caring and rehoming and stuff. Yes. And a lot of people do think about getting a rescue dog, but they're a bit worried that they think they're going to be badly behaved and that they've got all these problems. Do you find that to be the case? Yes and no, Lara. I think when you're actually looking for a rescue dog, whether it be from a shelter or a rescue, you have to do your homework, understand what breed you want, um, because genetics plays a big role in a dog's behaviour. Yes. These dogs don't necessarily come into rescue or into shelters through being perfectly behaved dogs, <laughs> but that's normally because mm. they've been let down and they haven't been trained. With training, mm. the dogs can go on to lead a really wonderful life and make wonderful companions. Yes, and has it helped you when you're taking in all different dogs, um, particularly when we introduce these guys today, we, you can really see the behaviour and some of the triggers that a lot of people might not ordinarily see. Like we remember Ronnie's tail was going up between her legs, which a lot of people might not notice. And another one, what about the tail wag? Well, I think that the tail wag's a big deal. It's a subtle um, behaviour in dogs. I mean, we all sit there and think, oh, the wagging tail, oh, gee, the dog's really happy. And, yes, And we go bouncing along and, oh, <laughs> the dog's really happy and things like that. But if you really watch, mm. the dog can be in a state of high arousal, depending on how that tail is positioned. Yes. So a dog with its tail right up in the air and it's looking really alert with just a little bit of shooting off at the end mm. could be sizing up. Yes how it's going to react and the reaction might not be a good one. Yeah, and that's often what you find when you're bringing multiple dogs multiple in together. Multiple dogs in together. And yes. what are some of the other tips then I guess that you would suggest to people if they are wanting to go on to become a foster carer or adopt a dog? If you're going to adopt a dog, 
think about the breed that you're going to adopt. Mm. Try and find out a bit of an understanding about the genetics and what the dog can actually, what it was bred for yes. or, 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 or what they're going to do. Like Bronnie here, she's a sight hound, mm -hmm. so therefore she chases. Yes, so hey Darth, if you get um, up and move, she might go after yeah, you. Yeah, she might think he's a little rabbit and off she goes. <laughs> um, she's been pretty good though. Yeah, she has and she and as she can tell she's pretty relaxed because she's really trying to have a look around at what's going around in her environment mm. at the moment. Mm. Yeah. Oh lovely. And so any other messages of people wanting to go on and maybe do the course? Look, I thoroughly recommend the course. Mm. Like I said, I, I think that I was a, a total no, no, novice, maybe even a little bit ignorant into dog mm. behaviour and dog psychology. And now I'd probably put myself as a novice and still learning because I'm learning all the time. Yeah, great. All right, thank you, Liz. If you'd like to find out a little bit more about the NDTF course, you can visit their website. And if you'd like to find out about Hair of the Dog Rescue, visit theirs. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Lara. Looking for somewhere to escape with your pooch? Then take a look at this week's Take Your Pet Feature Properties. Located 33 kilometres south of Gundagai, halfway between Sydney and Melbourne, Hillview Farmstay offers travellers a home away from home. The property provides families with a place where children can freely interact with farm animals and be immersed in beautiful rural Australia. There are six self-contained luxury accommodations, from a cosy one-bedroom cottage through to a four-bedroom house. There's also a glamping safari tent. With Australia's premier holiday parks entrenched in magnificent locations, Big Four is big by name, but also big by nature. Big Four has transformed the iconic caravan park into the modern day holiday experience. Accommodation options vary from camping and caravan sites to first rate self-contained holiday cabins. It's all backed by a wide range of top notch facilities and amenities. Plus, if travelling with your pet, selected Big Four holiday parks around Australia welcome dogs. For more pet-friendly accommodation ideas, visit the Take Your Pet website. If you'd like to check out all the antics with pooches at play, then check out our social media. We're on Instagram, Facebook and Twitter. Or if you'd like to learn more about how to look after your pooch, keep it healthy and happy, then check out our website for special articles. We've got training, grooming, some pet-friendly travel. Toys and accessories that your dog will love and more. And you can even sign up to our e-newsletter to get special member-only offers. Jump on poochesatplay.com. Now, Andrea, I've tried dog rocks before with my dog, George. He was peeing all over the place. The lawn had big brown patches on it and they worked. What's the secret? They do work. They are paramagnetic rocks. So when you put the rock into the water, cleans the water, takes out any rubbish that's found in tap water, dam water, rain water, whatever. Um, when the dog drinks the water, their pee no longer makes burn marks on the grass. Now I understand Maxie here is living proof of this. He is. Maxie's now 17 and a half years old. 17 and a half, is that dog years or human years? If he was a human, he would be 120 years old. Wow, you're a wise old pup, aren't you, mate? He is. So for giving Max, you know, his whole entire life water with dog rocks in it, it's given him a cleaner source of water, mm -hmm. which is much better for him. He does, his body doesn't have to process any rubbish found in our water. A perfect ambassador for dog rocks. He is, definitely. <laughs> Now we've featured the dog rocks before on season two, but for our new viewers, can you explain how to use them? Sure, so what you do is you grab a 200 gram pack of dog rocks, rinse them under tap water because they are covered in a slight rock dust, mm -hmm. put them into two litres of water, uh, wait for six hours and then your dogs can drink the water and just top up at night time, do that for two months and then replace the rocks. Now you have a similar product based on a similar ethos, it's basically a natural fertiliser for your lawn or garden. Exactly. Tell us about EcoDust. Okay, so EcoDust is the same type of rock but it's ground into a rock dust. As we've had dog rocks for 15 years, we know what the power of natural rocks is. It's a blend of 14 ingredients that provides both nutritional and physical benefits for plants and is non-leaching completely safe for rivers and waterways and will actually hold on to nutrients and water, giving your plants far better taste. It, it feeds them, it makes them grow better, it's great for your tomatoes, <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's healthy and good for you, great for animals, they won't get into it and get sick. Children, it's safe around children, great for our waterways. 
So no more harmful chemicals or fertilisers on no, our gardens and lawns? No chemicals at all are found in EcoDust. It is designed to be included primarily when planting edible crops and will add to the flavour and mineral density of home-grown plants so our food tastes better and we can keep our pets safe too. Where can I get the dog rocks and where can I get some eco dust? Okay, dog rocks are available online. They're available at most pet shops and vets. Eco dust is available online at ecodust.com.au. Brilliant. Well, I've tried the dog rocks. They work a treat. I'm going to get some eco dust and put them on my tomatoes. Beautiful. They'll taste even better. A delicious summer salad. Absolutely. You'd like that, wouldn't you, Maxie? Yes. <laughs> Today's smart pet is Lizzie the Labrador. She's certainly no one-trick pony, or should I say pooch. As far as I'm concerned, labelling her a smart pet is a slam dunk. While most pooches are rolling around the backyard, Lizzie is taking the term to a whole new level. Her antics are a barrel of laughs. Even when you're a little under the weather, she has a way of making you feel better. And while having fun is the top priority, Lizzie also knows when she has to behave like bowing to meet royalty. At the end of the day, when the fun comes to an end, Lizzie can even put herself to bed. Think your pet has the smarts to win our Smart Pets competition? Then make sure you get your entry in. One lucky viewer will receive a Pawson prize pack valued at over two and a half grand, including a $500 pet stock gift voucher, a year's supply of pet food, a $500 HIF wellbeing and massage voucher for you, and $500 worth of family parks gift vouchers. There's also three $100 pet stock vouchers for runner-ups. To enter, just send us a video of your pet doing their amazing trick. The more unique and talented, the better. So be as smart as your pet and enter to win. Visit poochesatplay.com for more details. Well, I mean, what sort of, what are you anyway? You've got some sort of poodle in you or something? Oh, guys, guys, we're all... Oh, sorry. <clears throat> well, that brings us to the end of another great show. It's been loads of fun sharing the screen with these two. Ah, uh, wait, uh, you're sharing the screen with us. Oh, OK, OK. <laughs> uh, team effort? Oh, OK. Ah, it's been a blast, guys. Can I come back again one day? Oh, sure thing, Hiff. It's always nice to do things a little differently sometimes. Uh, <laughs> you've got my number. <laughs> uh...